Hi, I'm Dr. Gwen. I'm a clinical psychologist who's been empowering disabled individuals, their families, and their support systems for over 20 years. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my channel where I curate tools, share mindsets, and promote habits that serve this community's health, safety, and happiness. Also, hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. Before you continue with this episode, I want to give you a heads up that we'll be discussing sensitive topics related to sexuality and sexual development. Depending on where you are and who you're with, you may want to save this episode for a different time. This episode is a continuation of the ongoing sex and relationship series. I welcome back Dr. Jamie Barstein, a clinical psychologist from the Help Group, and Dr. Eileen Crean, a clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Tufts University. We discuss how to positively support sexual curiosity in our neurodiverse community and inevitably explore factors surrounding pornography and masturbation. I love that we can have a real conversation about sexual development, where we healthily disrupt social and societal norms and empower through good information. I hope that the information shared in this interview helps you navigate the complex waters of sexual development that is just right for you and your family. Oh yeah, and all of the resources discussed in this episode are listed below. All right, let's get to it. Hi, Eileen and Jamie. Welcome. How are you guys doing? Good. Hi, how are you doing? Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, this is such a pleasure to do with both of you. Um, and today we are going to continue our sex and relationship series. So I'm so excited to welcome Eileen. Thank you for joining Jamie and I in our in our conversations. Yeah. So excited to be here. Yeah. And so I thought we could maybe start off with, you know, a topic that really comes up quite a bit in the work that I do and in the community that I'm in. And that is how do we safely and responsibly help our adolescents and young adults manage curiosity surrounding sexuality? So, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll throw this question out there and we'll go from there. But maybe Eileen, you know, you can start us off. Um, just, you know, how do we approach, um, curiosity around sexuality and maybe how that even bumps up against the access to technology, like the access that technology offers us as well, but maybe you can just kind of help us, you know, think about yeah. this. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times when we think about sex, obviously there's all this like stigma and whispering around the word. So we put such an adult lens on it. And I think this especially comes up when you, like young kids start to ask questions about sex. We're like, oh my gosh, like we have to have the sex talk now. And you're like, no, 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 not yet. Right. They don't know necessarily that saying, you know, penis in the grocery store isn't common social practice, right? It's yeah. just like a part of the body. Um, and so I think that if we can think about from early on, like it really is curiosity about something and our reaction to that early on set such a nice stage for having more complex conversations when they're 13, 14, 15. Um, so I think taking a pause and trying not to say, hey, this is a big, huge, heavy topic and let me get really into the nitty gritty with you right now is important. Um, and then I, I think the, the second big piece of that is thinking about, you know, do we want kids to learn about sex in developmentally appropriate ways? Yes, right? That is healthy and great. And that's what we want them to do. Um, but also having no access to anything is actually more dangerous, right? Because there's going to be times where they're going to have access to ideas and visuals and <laughs> opportunities. Um, and if they haven't had any ch chance to practice sort of lower level skills, that creates a potential for mess. <laughs> um, so I think yeah. it's not getting caught up in our adult ideas about curiosity around sex and then, um, you know, titrating exposure. Yeah, I love that. You know, it, it's so interesting because when we when you talk about reactivity or reaction, what that means is that as, as parents, we're all parents here, um, but as parents, we actually need to have an understanding of our own comfort level yeah. with sexuality and sexual development because mm -hmm. the reactivity is literally like reflexive. <laughs> So yeah. if we're right, if we're not 
really in tune or in touch with this for ourselves, then mm -hmm. I can see that the reaction when our kiddos bring up sex in some way, shape or form, it catches off catches us off guard. And then we kind of inadvertently, unintentionally add a weirdness and maybe even some shame surrounding it. So mm -hmm. then we start to shut down that conversation. Yeah. I think yeah. that self-reflection piece, that's something that sometimes we do in, um, like I'll do trainings with like school professionals or, or um, like medical professionals and say, okay, think about how you learned sex ed, because just like anything, that is where you start from, <laughs> right? So if this was something where you, uh, you know, a book was slid under your door when you were a kid and not a word was said out loud, having that conversation out loud for the first time, you know, with a patient or your own kid uh, is a big ask. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I think about the way that I learned about sex ed, which was not from my parents because we didn't talk mm -hmm. about it, right? Mm -hmm. It was not. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately learned it from my friends who mm -hmm. probably knew as much as I did. <laughs> and, you know, in reflection, I'm like, that those were not good sources of information, you know, <laughs> and we just kind of muddled through, you know, and it really wasn't until I had my own kiddo where... And she started to ask questions where I was like, oh, yeah, I need to I need to wrap my head around this um, and know where I stand with this. I love that reactivity. Jamie, you were going to say something. Yeah, well, I, mean, I have a question for you, actually. So I often find that parents will say to me, they feel like, you know, I teach the sex education groups in collaboration with you, actually, Eileen, and parents will often say, I don't know that my kid is ready or I'm worried that if they're joining this group, they're going to learn things and kind of plant ideas in their head that otherwise they maybe wouldn't have known or had access to. How do you kind of navigate that conversation with parents too? Because I imagine some parents might be listening saying, this sounds great, but I just don't know that my child is ready for this yet. And I love that you said to be having these conversations early, but how do you kind of approach that too? Yeah. Um, well, Jamie will know this question comes up all the time, right? It's like, oh, I would love to have that conversation, but they don't need it yet. And the both from, I think, clinical experience, right? But also from, they've done a lot of studies on this is like generally parents um, and teachers, we're just like way off when we think our kids are ready for this conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I think the average time that uh, the age that kids in the US are taught to use condoms is like, 18 and a half months after their first sexual experience or something like it's, wow. it's not, um, and that's not from, you know, that's a larger <laughs> study that, that I didn't run, but um, so, so that it's usually maybe some examination, like, mm, is that accurate? Right. But then also with social media stuff. And I think usually this, I think resonates with parents, like kids can just get access to stuff so much earlier than they could mm -hmm. ever before, right? You don't have to go look it up in the encyclopedia, which was a lot less, you know, <laughs> easy to access. And so then, you know, if they're going to run into it on the internet, even if you're watching carefully, even if you're, you know, reading through their texts or, you know, all the supervision you're giving them, wouldn't you rather the first dose of information come from you, even if it's incredibly awkward um, or maybe it goes really smoothly? Um, so I think that's, the, I usually just try to, comment like, well, we're not great estimators of when our kids need information and they're going to come across it. I can guarantee you they're going to come across the information. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, to, to varying degrees of success, I think. I, I think that's right. Um, you know, the other piece too, is that there is also like, there's more, we can be more subtle and gray area with this, right? So access or first dose, if you will, to this information can be developmentally appropriate. So it's it, so right. So it's like, oh, okay, well, developmentally, what is this person going to understand? Um, in, in if we were to talk about this, how does this need to be pitched? So it's not maybe necessarily that if it should be, but how it should be mm -hmm. is maybe where we have, you know, some more wiggle room with that, mm -hmm. you know, in regards to like when they're ready, you know, I get this question a lot, even surrounding like a diagnosis. When should I mm -hmm. tell my child about their diagnosis? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I just say it, with, it, in regards to that, and I don't know if this necessarily applies with um, sexual functioning and sex ed, but it's, I say it's, when they start asking questions and demonstrate curiosity surrounding it, 
is a really nice time to pick that up because the intent is there. So there's some like I'm I'm becoming aware of something. I'm make, maybe making some comments that may not be direct per se, but I'm making comments where I'm noticing differences or I'm comparing myself and something's not right mm -hmm. or why is it harder for me to do something? You know, these are the questions that I say, oh, okay, well, maybe this is a good time to start talking about identity. Who are you? You know, how does your brain work? These types of things. Mm -hmm. Would you mm -hmm. say from a sex ed perspective that this could also apply for parents? You know, and maybe they, they're starting to look at things or find things on socials or, uh, you know, um, you know, online, or they're starting to ask questions or talk about it. I, could that be an indicator? I think that'd be a good indicator. I mean, I would love to hear actually like the experience of, of you two. I, I think oftentimes, and maybe because of the type of work that we do, right? I mean, I get called when something has gone poorly, right? So there's yeah. an event, right? So like someone is caught masturbating on the bus, right? We're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> we need to have a conversation. Um, which I sometimes, you know, joke like a, you go to school for so long and now I get called when someone's masturbating on a bus, right? It's like how you know, I've been training for this this moment, but it's actually like, it's such an important conversation, right? So I think I am, you know, I love the work that I do. The downside is that I tend to meet with kids like when it's when it's a little too late, right? Not too late, but yeah, the conversation so would have been better if it had been earlier. And I think, I mean, Jamie and I worked together for a while, so I know at least sometimes that's that's true for her. So, but I think if the, if kids are showing curiosity, great. Um, you know, especially as a parent, I've been really, I think, building this library of like kids friendly books that have like different parts of bodies and different relationships. So then they're there, right? And then as a question comes up, there's materials there we can ask about. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think I, I agree with you, Eileen. I feel like too often, one of the reasons that exactly a family calls me, a parent calls me is because they, you know, something didn't go right, right? Like they're like you said, they're called mastery on the bus or whatever it is. And there's concern. Maybe there, maybe there's even some legal trouble, unfortunately, um, that we yeah. end up seeing, you know, young adults this way. And so I think the other thing that I try to tell parents too, is like, think about what your child has access to. Like, are they 13 years old and riding the bus to school? What are those other 13 year olds talking about on the bus? Right. Mm -hmm. So like, maybe your child isn't necessarily showing curiosity. Um, but what what are they being exposed to? And then also knowing that, um, I think there was a recent study that came out that showed maybe females with developmental disabilities or with autism often have slight delays in puberty, but otherwise the rates of puberty, and Eileen, you would know this better than me, but the, the research shows that rates of puberty are actually, you know, equal. And so those like feelings might be there, but expressing them and how to express them and where to express them, um, that knowledge base might not be there. So I always think about, you know, even if they're not really showing the curiosity, what, what are they being exposed to and how are they taking that in and how are they using that information? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, I mean, not to bring it too into like the research world since I think this is better to discuss sort of an applied topic, but the that's something that we need to explore a lot better, right? So there are, tables and like lists of information about normative sexual development, right? Like puberty starts. So you want to talk about puberty before puberty hits. So it's not a big, huge, terrible surprise, you know, the day you get your first period. Um, but, but the, you know, sex ed piece, at least the way that I think, you know, we think about it in the, this, this group of the three of us is like, yes, there's the physical part, right? Like I think people sometimes think my job is like teaching kids how to put condoms on bananas. I'm like, that's really a very, very small part of my daily activity, right? It's it's like, okay, let's talk about consent, right? That is something that um, everyone <laughs> struggles with. Um, and so if we can figure out how to teach that, great, um, in, in ways that are like accessible to all sorts of learners. Um, but I think that the, like the, that social piece, we don't know as much about the timing. Like when is that best mm -hmm. for folks on the spectrum, right? So if and those are skills that we tend to learn from peers. So if you've got someone who, you know, doesn't have a best friend or a small group of friends when they're 13, 14, 15, how can we augment that information, right? So they're still getting those lessons. Um, and is it on the same exact timeline? Would it be better to introduce earlier so you have more time to review it or to wait a little bit until, you know, someone maybe is interested in, in other relationships or something like that. So there's a lot left to learn. 
I, I love this. I, I mean, I, what I love about this is it's not black and white. Mm -hmm. And I know that mo people want that black and white definitive answer. This yeah. is when you start, you start at 13. This is when, you know, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that's when we should start, but this is really a matrix of decision-making that's right for a particular family and their child, whatever age yeah. their child is. Right. Because the other piece that, that I think I bump into are cultural um, factors as well, right? Like mm -hmm. what are the cultural factors or values of this family? The other is like language and communication. So on top of like social development, which I feel like social development oftentimes is very connected to language um, and communication development. This is another area that I find to be um, something that I'm always thinking about. How much does this person understand so, you know, so like Jamie, you and Eileen run this really phenomenal group, right, on sex ed. But what if we have an individual who is not able to get the information meaningfully in a group, mm -hmm. you know, in a group like that? What would your suggestions be? Or maybe you guys have some good resourcing on, you know, maybe it needs to be done in a one on one fashion with a parent and their child or like even like a mentor, or an aide or a coach or mm -hmm. something. But what I mean, do you guys have any suggestions for for that piece? You the program that we were running, I mean, you're originally doing one on one, right? And then it was to see if we could adapt it into a group setting. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see kind of how that differs, like a one on one versus a group. I mean, I think for a lot of the individuals who join our group, they were wanting that access to a peer group. And actually we even had, we just ran our first round of it and we had, you know, a lot of the young adults said, we don't want this to end actually. We want to keep meeting informally so that we can ask each other questions because they wanted kind of the, you know, things like our last little group we had, people were asking, um, what date, what dating sites are good like but you know what it, it, and I'm like I don't really know but we talk about it as a group and and discuss you know with your peers what dating sites are good but I agree that there are some people that maybe that group setting is like not the right setting they're a little intimidated or it's hard for them to talk about these topics and then maybe one-on-one -on -one is appropriate you know whether it's with um like running this similar curriculum or with a mentor um, you know, I often, often say that to parents that if, if you feel really like you're not the person to talk to, let's find someone else for, for your child or young adult to talk to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a really interesting, um, book that I can, I share the name, um, with you. I'm going to mess up exactly the order of the words in the title, but it breaks down different sex ed topics by um, developmental stage as opposed to chronological age. Um, and I think that that's really important because like if you've got like the, the curriculum that um, Jamie and I are using is wonderful. It's actually like demonstrated to be effective in a one-on-one -on -one setting um, through a randomized controlled trial, but it's, it's very verbal, right? Like there's yeah. um, few visuals. It's a lot of discussion and it's great. Like for the folks who can access that, I think it's really good um, obviously, but for folks who can't, <laughs> that's yeah. troubling. Um, and so I think things like basic things like making sure you have, you know, if, if your student is able to to handle that, have words for different body parts and like even if they're sort of sexual parts on communication devices, right? So they can tell you right, the things that are going on. Um, there are some curricula that exist for folks who have like more limited communication. So even if it's things like, you know, private versus public, like defining mm -hmm. where behavior is appropriate. Um, I think that's really key uh, and, and making, you know, this idea of like who talks about what, like there's this real dispersion of responsibility around sex ed, I think. And I think this is true for everyone. Like, I think like we're talking about like, oh, we work with, you know, autistic teens or adults. Um, but I, I think it's actually, we're doing a better job about communicating about it in the, in the autism world. But like, you know, if family wants to teach values around sex ed, then yeah, so let's make sure that they're doing that. And the teacher knows they're not doing that, but the teacher's in charge of teaching about, you know, self-care or whatever it is, sort of map out a plan um, so it doesn't get lost. Yeah, yeah. So Eileen, maybe I can get that. Um, I'll get that resource from you and I'll put it in the description. 
just so that if parents or, you know, professionals are listening to this, they can, they can maybe access that. And then the curriculum that you guys use, I mean, obviously, Jamie, you run that at Advance LA. What is the curriculum called? It's called tackling. Sorry, I'm making sure I lean and I, I was like, is Eileen going to answer that? That's all right. <laughs> um, tackling, it's, it's actually a program that was developed in, in the Netherlands called Tackling Teenage, wait, Eileen, I'm going to butcher it. Tackling, yeah, tackling, no, you're right. tackling teen teenage training. training. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, like Eileen said, originally developed in a one-on-one. Um, there's a you know great research study that shows it's effective and Eileen, you're you're also doing it one on one at Tufts, is that right? Yeah, we're trying to compare the the individual and the group format because it's it's 18 weeks, which is good because it's comprehensive. But it, you know, in our medical system, an 18 week one on one session. Yeah, yeah, and we it's really for teenagers, and we adapted it for young adults into a group setting, um, and. We, you know, we just finished running that group. So we got some good, you know, pre post data on it. So Eileen and I will have fun looking at that. Um, but we, we had, I mean, the young adults really liked it and we're planning on launching a, a second program. So, um, but right now the curriculum itself isn't available for purchase or anything, but because I think it's just kind of in the, um, you know, we're still, we're still looking at it. That's awesome. Really That's focused. awesome. Yeah. You know, let's, I mean, let's kind of circle back to curiosity because um, as we're talking about ways to support healthy curiosity um, in a, in a, in a responsible way, um, I can't help but think about what parents bump up against quite a bit, which is pornography. Um. This is really, for me, you know, that intersection of curiosity and access to technology. Um, Mm -hmm. Or again, Jamie, back to exposure, right? Whether it's I'm exposed because of my peer group or I'm exposed because I kind of have no guardrails on my socials or YouTube. Or Netflix. I mean, or go, Netflix. I mean, right. Or whatever there that are is. There's shows on Netflix right now that are bordering <laughs> pornography. Or Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So can we talk about how the conversation of pornography comes up for you guys in your groups and how you might help parents manage this, this topic? If you want to start there, I'd love to hear if there were any conversations about in the adult group, but I can. Yeah, no, yeah. there were. So it was interesting. I feel like what we focused on so much around pornography in the adult group that kept coming up was how unrealistic porn is. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the porn. And so we were, we actually were talking about some sites that have more realistic porn um, because I think what also happens and th- this is, you know, for everyone is that you kind of have this idea about what sex and your sex life is supposed to be like based on, you know, whether it's social media or porn or whatever it is. And then we know, you know, that that's not really how it goes, right? Like <laughs> there, you know, we, I think we saw some meme or something that one of the young adults found that was like, what porn makes you think your first time or movies make you think your first time having sex is versus the reality. Right. And so, you know, that was what came up a lot for us was this idea of um, how porn can influence what your expectation is of sex. And, and, you know, I mean, I mean, consent too. like a lot of things within, within porn also borderline life was, was there consent? Was there not consent here? And so a lot of what we were doing was actually like depicting um, and, and taking apart, you know, what what was kind of giving us the wrong impression around porn. Um, and then there were some really interesting discussions too about like, what if I'm not interested in porn? And it was like, that's totally fine. You don't have to be interested in porn. And and a lot of discussions around where do I access porn? I mean, we have a, I had a really awesome parent that I worked with of a young adult who would drive him to um like a adult bookstore let him go in 
there's an agreement that he didn't have to show her what he bought or anything, but as long as it was a place that was like legal and it was adult content, he could buy what he wanted and he could have it in his bag, bring it in the car. You know, that's like a, that's a really cool example. I'm not sure that everyone would feel as comfortable doing that. Um, but I think, you know, there's this also these ideas around, well, like, am I supposed to hide it? Is this like a shame around using porn? So there's all these interesting discussions, I think, um, that were important to talk about with the, with uh, the reason I like the group is because it was with peers, right? It was like normalizing, Hey, it's okay to, to want to view porn and also, okay, if you don't want to view porn. That's so cool that they were able to talk about that because it's really, there's so many social rules around porn that we don't get taught, right? Um, and so to learn that in a group of peers is really, really awesome. There yeah. Something that came up. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Um, the the we ran a study out of our lab last year where we we're asking autistic adults and um neurotypical adults about their about learning about porn and the one um <laughs> finding was that whether or not they had sex ed um or or not no matter what your diagnosis diagnostic status was no one was talking about porn um and so to be able to incorporate it into a sex ed part, i think like that and things like i think oftentimes this gets clumped but like sexting right that wasn't something that had to be in sex ed programs 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> um, but, but now, when there's so, you know, the rules about that, that there's legal troubles that come right yeah. on the heels of that. And, and, you know, we don't teach directly about that. Like, like Jamie was saying, you know, we have really explicit conversations in our groups. Like, you know, if you're going to look at porn and, you know, that's a whole separate discussion in of itself, but like, do not ever look at someone under the age of 18. If you're not sure, don't look at it close the box. Like, and so we have really clear discussion, like, do not look at this at the library, right? Um, you know, mm-hmm. where the, the, the rules around it and, you know, the conversation that Jamie is, is describing is much more interesting and right. And I think probably helpful. I think a good starting point, And especially I find like, if parents are nervous about it, like you can, that's a really tangible conversation to have and, um, really important. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think the legal troubles are, um, are sneaky, um, if you mm-hmm. will, because even screenshotting and texting someone else under, I mean, it's, there are so mm-hmm. many catches to this that, um, I do think that having some explicit direction for that, the problem is no one wants to talk about this Yeah, and that it's, it's all over the place. Um, mm-hmm. the fact that we're not talking about it is really, I think setting some of like, I'll say so setting up some of like my community up for failure, for problems, mm-hmm. um, because we don't want to talk about it. And, and I, I feel like this is also akin to masturbation, right? Where mm-hmm. there are rules like you, you know, you just said, don't, don't ever look up at, don't ever look up porn in the library. I mean, masturbation mm-hmm. could follow some of these similar rules, right? Like, yes, yes. Um, there, right. there is a, we're not saying no, we're saying there's a place and a time. And again, this also, I think, does also then bump into family values and the, the differences that, and the cultural values, right, that, that we experience is what is appropriate for someone in a particular family versus another family. And so how do we then develop these kind of robust uh current modern kind of sex ed groups um and curriculums to really meet the times um how do we do that it's it's i think this is really tricky and i'm glad we're talking about it because no one wants to talk about this yeah. every it's you know it's a taboo topic well and i'm just thinking I, a lot of the young adults we work with also are are living with their parents mm-hmm. um and and you know something especially in the past year as we were all like you know working from home I think a lot of people maybe they would have been in school and they were back at home because things were closed but we really have a lot of young adults who live with their parents and so there's also this idea of how do I have privacy within my home and so one of the things I think was really helpful that we explored within the group was you know do you feel like you have a place that you can kind of explore your, you know, sexual urges 
And how do you make sure you have that place within the home that your family members are going to kind of leave you to, to be private, right? So like, there's the concept of where is it appropriate to do this? But also if you're in your home and you close your bedroom door and you lock it, it's not going to start knocking and say, what are you doing in there? Right. So like, how do you get your private time to do this? And so I think this is, you know, for the neurotypical population too, is, is figuring out, um, Within the family, how do you make this work, right? So maybe it's a conversation with parents around, hey, we, you know, we want you to be able to do what you're going to do in your room. That's your private area. But when you're in the living room, that's like a shared family space. So it's something that I also would encourage parents to talk about with their their kids or their young adults around, um, you know, where is an appropriate place and time to do this? Where can you keep these materials, right? So like if Maybe if grandma comes over, we don't want to have your, if you have a magazine, whatever, sitting on the counter, but maybe it's, you know, in your room and especially in the drawer that I'm not going to go in. That's your drawer. It's your room, whatever you want it to be. And so I think that's an important concept too, of just this idea around um, how do we make sure that we're respecting each other within the home? Natalie, I think you were going to say something too. No, very, very similar to that. I think, you know, I have a family I worked with once where um, we use the like a blue dot to indicate places yeah. that were appropriate to masturbate, right? Um, and that first required like for for this, it was a kid was more limited communication, and so it was just a way to label spaces like you know not to keep going back to the bus, but like the bus would be a red dot, right? Not here, mm-hmm. but in your room with the door closed, the blue dot that's an okay spot. Um, and so I think that that you know. I, I have yet to meet a parent who's been like, you know, they have their new baby and they're like, gosh, I can't wait to like explain masturbation <laughs> to you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, here we are. <laughs> um, and, and you know, yeah. And like, I don't know. You know, we know that humor is a really good teaching tool. Like we respond to material when we engage in it. And like, yeah, is it sort of funny to have a conversation with your kid or your parent about masturbation? Yes. Isn't it comfortable? Yeah. Like there's no, t- I mean, Jamie, let me know if you figured this this out recently, but I don't know of a tip where I'm going to be like, and now it will be smooth and it will be lovely. And you'll be so glad no. you talked about it. No. But it's important. Right. Just like any other conversation. The parents yeah. Have. No, in the group too, we would do a warning. I'd be like, okay, everyone, I'm about to show a penis on the screen and here it is, you know, <laughs> and just that made everyone laugh too of like, just a warning. It's coming up because I'm screen sharing with you right now, you know, and here we go. Let's talk about it. Three, so two, I, I, one. <laughs> there you there, there, there. Well, I mean, so again, yeah. Yeah. I'm, you're so right though. Like, um, I, this is why I really like that, that this series like exists because we're just, mm-hmm. we just want to have conversations about this. Like, let's just, let's try to encourage dialogue. And, and we do, I mean, I think humor is a fantastic, um, way to make things lighter, to, to just lighten, you know, things. It doesn't have to be so serious. Um, and so I just, I love that we're having this dialogue. Awesome. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of resources like uh, already, you know, I've already picked up a few resources, whether it's the, um, the book that you were talking about, Eileen, where the development is offered for developmental age versus chronological age, I don't even even know if it'd be appropriate, Jamie. I mean, if you, if we share some of the sites that you guys um, talked about, yeah. that, you know, feel safer or not as you know over the top for people. Maybe that can be something. I just want to be able to give you know our community some kind of practical um, things to 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 rest on here. Um, so you know, I always end um, these interviews, and I've already asked Jamie this question, Eileen. But I'm wondering um, if you could only choose one skill to empower in your clients um, or the people that you work uh, with. What would it be, and why? I feel like I should have been more prepared for this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's always better when it's spontaneous, skill. really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think being able to express directly and compassionately what you want, mm. um, I think would be, I think, I feel like maybe that's cheating because then you'd have to be able to identify it in the first place. But I, th- I think that that like having that, being able to express that to someone else would, would, 
could solve a lot of upset. Um, yes. I'm going to go. Yeah. I'm going to go with that. Yeah. It's, a, it's it. a good one. And we'll let it go even though self-awareness is – is really, you know, par for the course when you're advocating in that beautiful way. But we'll let it slide this time, Eileen. Um, we'll, we'll just, you know, we'll just have you back and then we'll like ask you again and then you, you can yeah, say something, something else is, is what it is. <laughs> oh my. For- yeah, exactly. exactly. Thank you guys so much for being here and for helping, you know, just helping us understand these these really important concepts. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having us. Fun to see you both. Hey, thanks for watching. If you are interested in finding out more about Jamie or Eileen, their information is in the description below. If you got any value from this episode, please hit that like button and subscribe to this channel. Doing so helps to get this information to others just like you. See you in the next episode.